Hello, welcome to the I'm Excited Podcast. I am your host, David Hicks. Whether you're watching or listening, thank you for doing so. It's my goal, especially in this series, that you are blessed with knowledge and wisdom and understanding of God's enemy, his nemesis, Satan, and how Satan is at war with us. What some of his tricks and his traps are so that you can overcome them, you can avoid them, and help others do the same. So, as you've seen, this is part two, and uh, if you didn't see part one, thank you even more for tuning in. And let me explain what we saw in part one, and then you can decide whether or not you'd like to go back and, and listen or, or watch the whole thing, uh, the, the, yeah, the, in its entirety. So, what we've learned so far is Satan is an accuser. He's a slanderer. And eventually, when we get to it, when we get to the story of Job, if for those of you who have seen the video, Job's at the bottom of the video, uh, at the bottom of my whiteboard of uh, things to cover. But once we get to that point, this is a story, and you can go ahead and read it. This start, Job starting at chapter 1, in particular chapters 1 and 2, you'll see an example of Satan being an accuser, a slanderer of Job. He, he serves... For a long time in his history, he was like a prosecutor, putting us on trial. Those of us who put our faith in God, put our faith in uh, now, we, those of us who put our faith in Jesus, but especially back then at this point in history, he would accuse us before God, slander us, and give us God all sorts of reasons as to why he shouldn't be compassionate toward us, shouldn't be merciful, shouldn't be forgiving, and, all, and why yeah, all the reasons that our love for him was just fake. Our faith in him wasn't real. So that's the kinds of things that Satan has done in the past, being served as an accuser, a slanderer of us before our father. Thanks a lot. The other thing we said, uh, the, but the main thing we saw is that Satan played this role of adversary, opposer. Because we looked at Revelation chapter 12, the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, remember the Bible is a collection of books, writings throughout history. And in that very last one, John, a messenger, a special messenger of Jesus, known as an apostle, is given a series of visions. And by the time he gets to chapter 12, there's a change in the scenery, if you will. And there, he sees this... Um, brilliant, amazing, glorious woman. She's ready to give birth. And the indication is she's going to give birth to Jesus, the Son of God. And on the scene is a dragon, a terrifying dragon with seven heads, ready to devour the child who's meant to rule all nations. That's how we know it is in reference to Jesus. And the moment that Jesus is born, the moment the baby's born, but the baby is caught up to the throne of God, which, if you really think about it, indicates uh, or get, paints a picture of God on his throne with baby Jesus in his arms, caring for him, loving him, protecting him. This dragon also goes after the woman who gave birth to Jesus. And, of course, we know from the story of the life of Jesus, that's Mary. The woman in Revelation 12 could be symbolic of more than just Mary. I'm not going to dive into that. But at minimum, the woman represents Mary. And so the dragon goes after her. She's protected. God protects her as well. In rage, the dragon and his angels fight against the angel of God. The angels of God led by Michael. And Satan, the dragon, and his angels lose. They lose the battle. They're at war with God, but they lost, and yet they are still fighting. They were cast out of heaven, cast down to earth. And in rage, the dragon still tries to go after the woman who gave birth to Jesus, but he fails. The earth protects the woman. And then, just being livid, Satan goes off to do what? To make war with those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. If you 
have already made this decision to keep the commandments of God, to share the testimony of Jesus and to live by it, Satan's at war with you. His angels are at war with you. Now, you may be wondering, what, Satan has angels? Yes. In Revelation, we see, it literally says, the dragon and his angels warred against Michael and his angels. And if we read Revelation 12 properly, correctly, if our understanding is correct, that's what I'm trying to say, it seems to indicate that a third of the angels of heaven sided with Satan in this rebellion against God, in this war against God. About a third. And so, no matter how many sided with Satan, many did. But they lost. But now they can't beat God. They can't even beat his army of angels. But they're still living. They're still mad. They still want to hurt God because they know their destination is a tortuous punishment that is not going to stop. And so what are they doing? They're going after the weakest ones they can find. Us. Human beings. And their goal is to get us to stop keeping the commandments of God and to reject the testimony of Jesus. Now Satan is he's not as powerful as God. He's not as knowledgeable as God. But what we're going to see today is he at least thought he was so close to it that he thought that he himself could be God. And, you know, being at war with God, well, that's your goal. Your goal is to win the battle and become God yourself. That's the only realistic goal to have if you're going to fight against God himself. And the scriptures we're going to look, look at this, that seem to tell this story are Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. But before we read them, I want to try and explain something. God often has a way of talking to about two things at the same time. An example of this is Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Now, for those of you in the video, you probably see that I have these little markers in my Bible to make sure that I have every verse that we're going to talk about marked. And guess which one I forgot to mark? The very first one we're going to read. But by God's grace, I got there quickly. Here we go. The prophet Isaiah is, is speaking the words of the Lord. He says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, to give you the history of Israel, Abraham was a man who had great faith in God. And God blessed him. It said that, you know, he'd have... His, through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed, which is a prophecy of Jesus, a seed, a descendant of Abraham. And God shared these same promises with Isaac, Abraham's son, and with Jacob, Abraham's grandson, whom God whom, whose name God changed to Israel. And another one of those promises that God made was that the descendants of Abraham, the descendants of Isaac, the descendants of Jacob would be so numerous that you couldn't count them. It'd be like the, trying to count the stars in the sky or the sand by the seashore. It'd be so numerous. And that was a prophecy of the nation of Israel. And so one of the things that happened early on from the, of the descendants of Jacob was that they were enslaved in Egypt. Now at this point in time, they were also known as Hebrews. Hebrews are Israelites. But at this point in time to which I'm referring, uh, they were slaves in Egypt. And you probably heard the story about Moses and the ten plagues and the crossing of the Red Sea and how God broke them out of Egyptian slavery. God delivered them from being from their bondage as slaves in Egypt in fantastic ways, amazing ways. And so, you know, if you were a, a Jew, an Israelite back then, you'd hear this message and that's what you'd think about. When Israel was a child, I loved him, God said. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But later on, 
Jesus himself experienced something similar in that when Jesus was born, an angel appeared to Joseph, Mary's husband. You can think of Joseph as being Jesus' stepdad or adopted dad. And the angel told him, get up, flee, go to Egypt, because Herod, who was the Roman, the appointed Roman ruler of that region, uh, during in which you know Bethlehem and the surrounding region was ruled by Herod. And Herod got wind that a new king had been born, a prophecy had been fulfilled. And so Herod was going to seek baby Jesus to kill him. But the angel warned Joseph, Joseph about this in, the, in a dream and told him to get up, run to Egypt. This is part of the Christmas story. As I'm telling this, and this is you know the Christmas time of year. And so Joseph did that. He obeyed. He married Jesus, went down and lived in Egypt for an unknown period of time until the angel came back to Joseph and spoke to Joseph again in a dream and said, okay, you can get up. It's safe. Go back to Israel. The ones who were seeking the life of the child, they're all dead. And then Jesus and Mary and Joseph went back to Israel and lived in a town called Nazareth. So Matthew points this out, that this Jesus, this time in Jesus' life where he goes to Egypt and then is drawn and then is um, lives there and then is called back out and goes to live back in Israel, as that whole thing is a fulfillment of this prophecy. Where God says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Now that phrase, out of Egypt I call my son, is filled full of meaning. It has a double meaning, because it's not just God calling Israel, the nation, out of Egypt, out of Egypt delivering them from slavery. It's calling his own son, Jesus, out of Egypt to return to Israel, to live there. It was a prophecy. It had a double meaning. God was talking about the nation of Israel, but his own son at the same time. So I use that as an example to help us understand Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, because neither one of them mentioned the devil. Well, for one reason, this, is, this was written in Hebrew. Devil is a Greek word, okay? Neither one of them mentioned Satan, I should say. That's the Hebrew term. Uh, but they certainly seem to give us an understanding of Satan's origin story. Isaiah chapter 14, we'll read verse 12 through 19. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 19. Now, to give you the context, okay, uh, let's back up to verse 3 and 4. Isaiah the prophet writes this, It shall come to pass in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow. He's talking to the Israelites who were, uh, had been disobedient to the Lord. Many of them end up being becoming prisoners of the Babylonian Empire, taken away to Babylon and the regions of the Babylonian Empire because of their rebellion against the Lord. Uh, but Isaiah says this, It shall come to pass in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow and from your fear and the hard bondage in which you were made to serve, that you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say how the oppressor has ceased, the golden city ceased. And so what we're hearing, what we're about to read, is actually part of this, these words spoken against the king of Babylon. All right? That's the literal context uh, that it's a message against the king of the Babylonian Empire. So, we get to verse 12 and Isaiah is continuing the same discourse against the king and he says this, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Lucifer is a name that means day star. Stars were often uh, used as symbols of of angels and other spiritual beings. In fact, Jesus himself is called the morning star. And so, again, he says, how you are fallen from heaven. Now, where have we seen that before? Revelation 12, Satan and his angels being cast out of heaven. O Lucifer, son of the morning, 
how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. Does not Satan weaken the nations? Does not Satan deceive the whole world by distracting us and getting us from put and keeping us, deceiving us and not putting our faith in God and Jesus? He weakens the nations by getting us not to trust him. Verse 13, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook kingdoms? Who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities? Who did not open the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, all of them sleep in glory. Everyone in his own house, but you are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch, like the garment of those who are slain, thrust through the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a corpse trodden underfoot. Satan's end will be disastrous. So if this is one of those passages that has that double meaning, it's not just about the king of Babylon, but God is talking about the king of Babylon and Satan at the same time. If that is what is going on here, what do we learn about Satan? His ambition was to be God. His ambition was to be God. That certainly seems to be the case because one verse that does mention Satan blatantly is 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6. Here Paul is giving instructions to Timothy about whom to appoint, whom to seek out to be shepherds of God's people, bishops as Paul refers to them. And one of the things that he tells Timothy is that someone who's appointed to the office of bishop, to the role of shepherding the church, verse 6, should not be a novice. In other words, a new convert. Lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Being puffed up with pride. When someone who's new in the faith is given such an an important position. They'll probably look at themselves and say, wow, look how important I am. Look how great I am. I, I haven't been doing this very long and look at all the, the responsibility I've been given. Look how great I am. And so they lift their heart in pride, which God detests. Like who did? Like the devil did. That's what Satan did. He lifted his heart up in pride. If your ambition is to be God himself, we need to be like God in embracing his values, loving others, caring about others, ministering to the suffering, letting other people know about his son. We need to be like God in that. But our aim shouldn't be to be God himself. And that's what the devil's ambition was, if not based on Isaiah 14, based on what we saw in Revelation 12. Let's read another passage like that. Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning at verse 11. Ezekiel 28, beginning at verse 11. The beautiful thing about, the, the hard thing to, for me to learn about bookmarks is that they only work if you actually try to use them. So maybe I should try to use it. Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning at verse 11. Now, we need, again, back up and get the context. At the start of this chapter, Ezekiel writes, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods, in the midst of the seas. You are a, yet you are a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that be hidden from you. 
With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. There's actually sarcasm in the Bible. By your great wisdom and trade, you've increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God. Now, let me explain. <laughs> I, pro I probably read too much there. Please forgive me. Okay, Tyre is located on the Mediterranean Sea. It was a lucrative city because of its trading. And in that lucrative city, there was much pride and there was much sin. Now, this might also be one of those passages where he's talking to the prince of Tyre and saying, you know, as he said, you know, and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God's. That's kind of the thing that we believe was in Satan's heart. But I don't think that's in this particular passage that double meaning is there. Why? Because this is directed to the prince of Tyre kind of an odd person to write. If there's a king in Tyre, why would you write to one of his sons? That doesn't make sense. So I don't think this is literally to a prince in Tyre, the city of Tyre. I think this is meant, this first part is meant for whoever rules Tyre at this moment in time. Because when we get to verse 11, Ezekiel ups the game. Verse 11, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. We've gone from the prince to the king. See, I think what's happening here, this is opinion, okay, let me flag it, is that the first segment of chapter 28 is toward whoever rules Tyre at the time. But... This portion that we're about to read is for the one who's behind the ruler, the spiritual one, Satan. I think this is a veiled message to Satan. Could be wrong. It could be a section where it's, you know, another double meaning, literally to the king of Tyre, but also indicating Satan. Let's read, and I'll let you judge for yourselves. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Eden was hundreds, thousands, years before this time. Not many thousands, but a couple. He says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now, what is a cherub? Cherub is, well, I wrote here a fantastic spiritual being. Do you want to consider a cherub just a, 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 a you, you can look at it one of two ways. As a race separate and apart from angels, or you can look at it as just a fancier, more glorious angel than the normal angel. Either way, they're fantastic spiritual beings. You can read about them in detail in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. Not, don't have time to look at those today. But they are pictured very differently from normal angels. And they seem to be greater, mightier, and in closer relationship with God than your everyday angel. They seem to be greater, more powerful, mightier, closer relationship with God than the rest of the angels. So this king of Tyre is referred to as a cherub and perfect until iniquity was found in him. It goes on in verse 16, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. 
Therefore, I cast you as a profane, profane thing out of the mountain of God. Again, that imagery of being cast out of the mountain of God. One of the things that Jesus told his disciples is he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Fall like lightning from heaven. Being cast out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. From the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst and devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. In the sight of all who saw you, all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Read about Satan's end, and we do know he will become a horror and will be no more forever. Uh, at least no more of a threat to anyone in the kingdom of God. So if this is indeed directed at Satan or a double meaning, where it's at the, directed at the king of Tyre, but it's also talking about Satan at the same time, then Satan was a cherub, a fantastic spiritual being, and he lifted it again. He lifted his heart up in pride and thought he was great enough to be God himself, to take the place of God, to conquer the throne of God. Pride is the most dangerous thing it is one of the things that God cannot stand. It is where we think we are better than others. Don't do that. I'm not saying hate yourself. I'm not saying bash yourself over the head. I'm just saying simply have an attitude that I will not think of other people. Now, I will not think of myself as being better than others. We're all sinners. We all make mistakes. We all are imperfect. Only Jesus was perfect in following God. And we are not Him. But if we put our faith in Him, if we turn from our own ways and decide to live by His, we're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God washes our sins away. We're forgiven. We just need to grow from there in faith and love, knowledge, wisdom, mercy, compassion. And God's grace will be with us when we mess up until He gets us home. But please do not give in to the deception of Satan and refuse to trust God, refuse to trust Jesus, abandon them because of whatever problems may be in your life. Hang in there. We're going to keep talking about this and hopefully it will help you to overcome Satan and follow the Lord. Thank you for listening.